on the medication that I was on, I'm, I'm still like, I have the attention span of a gnat <laughs> and cry for no reason. So I already cry when I do these things. <laughs> so it's, it's a hot mess, but try to listen to the words. Um, <clears throat> I titled this Everyday Faith, and um, I, I was totally going to do another message. I, I had a thought of this quirky, fun um, theme to do, and I really want to do it, and I started working on it, but again, I have the attention span of a gnat, so I'm like, I got I to gotta simplify this. I, I'm going to pick a theme that <laughs> we all know, and um, I'm, I have to do a talk um, next month, it turns out, at a uh, chrysalis, at a journey, and it's the faith talk, so I'm like, okay. <laughs> If I have to do two talks, I'm going to also, I'm going to, I'm going to combine them. So I used some of their, some of their outline stuff, um, suggested points and, and ideas that I'm going to hit on in that talk. And I worked it into this one. So, um, I'm practicing on you guys. Uh, the topics aren't new to any of us. I don't think I'm delivering any life-changing insights, but I do hope that this dusts off some of our neglected corners and refreshes some of our habits. Um, the post-it I handed to you is, don't write anything on it, but at the end of the sermon, I'm going to ask that you um, Think of one thing you do every day that's pointless and thoughtless. You don't have to do about it. You're on autopilot. And that one thing that you don't even think about. And I want you to write that down. And I want you to, on purpose, pray before doing those things this week. And that's what that post-it is for. Um, <clears throat> so prayer. Um, I mean, faith and prayer. Um, scripture. See, I have the attention span of a gnat. <laughs> um, scriptures. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 1 Corinthians 16.13. Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. That's NLT, and I'm going to read that same one from the message. 1 Corinthians 16.13. Keep your eyes open, hold tight to your convictions, give it all you got, be resolute, and love without stopping. Ephesians 6, 16, with all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I'm going to start with a story. I'm, I'm thinking some of you have heard it before, but it's still funny. One night, a man was walking along a path. He stumbled over a cliff and fell a considerable distance before catching himself on a branch. Looking down, he realized he might be killed if he dropped to the ground. And there seemed no way to climb back up either. So he began yelling for help. Is anyone up there? He bellowed. Is anyone around? Can anyone hear me? Pretty soon, a calm voice answered, Yes, I am here. The man paused in surprise and replied, Okay, can you help me? The voice answered, Yes, I can help you. The man paused again. Who are you? To which the voice responded, I am God. After another long pause, the man asked, What do you want me to do? God answered, let go of the branch and depend on me to save you. This time the pause was even longer. Finally, the man called out, is there anybody else up there? Faith is something that each of us deals with in our everyday life. And I think that there are different styles of faith. There is faith that moves mountains. Those are the ones you read about in the Bible. Faith that moves your mountains. And there is the kind of faith that you draw on when you're like Daniel in the lion's den. There is faith in the leap and in the falling, knowing that God will catch you. And there's also quiet faith. That's our everyday faith. 
the faith that holds you up. We can live a large part of our life on autopilot because of faith, our thoughtless everyday faith. We have faith that we will wake up in the morning and when we flip on a light switch, there is no thought to it. You have faith when sitting in a chair, riding in a car, going to the grocery store, having a drivable route to work, even though Logan still insists on leaving 10 minutes early just in case. <laughs> that the fridge kept your food fresh. All this is done without thought, because, but these things are vital. Things that would be notable if they were gone. But maybe we don't expect those things as part of our faith in God. When we bring people, when people bring up the capital letter faith, People probably think of things like that story about falling over a cliff or being thrown into the lion's den. Tests of faith. But I'm emphasizing everyday faith, our autopilot faith, the mundane. <clears throat> so we're going back to basics. It's a new school year after all. In order to have strong faith in God, we need to do three things. One, have a willingness to step out and let go. Two, humble yourself. First Peter says, you can't be self-reliant, stiff-necked, or prideful if you say you are a part of the body of Christ's church. And three, pray. I'm going to spend a lot of time on three. Only with open communication will you be able to move with God's plan. Faith enables a life of wholeness. It's not theoretical. It actively involves you personally and intimately connecting with God, something made possible because of Jesus. Faith is simple, but it is not easy. And that is because life is complicated and full of moments, moments of the mundane and of the life changing. So <clears throat> to that first point, having the willingness to step out and let go. It is here in that talk I'm giving next month that I wanted to elaborate, that they want me to elaborate on stepping out for these teens, these big moments of faith, Daniel in the lion's den kind of faith. Those moments are easy. I mean, not easy, easy, but obvious, maybe. To know when you are leaning into God's grace, that you are hanging on, to, on a branch. You know when you're hanging on a branch. And you know when you choose to let go. You are actively reaching for your faith and stretching that muscle. These are big, obvious moments where you choose God, where you ask Jesus to stand next to you. We study the Bible and we train for those moments. We ask others to lift us up as we prepare to leap into those moments. Does anybody have any prayer requests? But I'm not talking about those big moments today. I'm attempting to focus on everyday faith. Faith when we are on cruise control, when nothing is signaling for your attention, when no one is focusing their prayer on you, when you have done that task a hundred times, and when you are on cruise control. Write it down. Okay, so what does faith in God mean to you? The cookie cutter answer is faith means that we let go and let God. We've all heard it, right? So that brings us to number two. Humble yourself. You can't be self-reliant, stiff-necked, or prideful if you are part of the body of Christ's church. Don't think you can do any of it without God or without the people around you. We don't practice that humility enough. And it's really hard to ask for help. There's a story in the Bible about four friends tearing a roof apart to get their friend in to see Jesus. And we can all picture it. What lengths wouldn't we go to to get our friend, the person we loved, through that roof? But what if it was you that was broken? Would you ask your four friends to do that for you? Would you humble yourself to not only ask God, but ask us, your family? We are God's hands and feet after all. What kind of faith do we have without the support of his people? 
I think I just went a little deeper with the big moments again. But back to everyday faith. We have to be careful not to see those big moments as separate from the small ones. It's careless to think parts of our lives are disconnected from our relationship with God. In the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> Jesus teaches that God cares deeply about the small things, the birds in the air, the flowers of the field. If God values these things, how much more does he care about our everyday lives? You know, those moments where we forget to invite him in. Not on purpose, it just doesn't matter. Scripture is full of ordinary people living ordinary lives who are used by God in extraordinary ways. Ordinary people. We read about the highlights of their faith journeys, but we often forget that they lead mundane lives. They have entire years, decades. Abraham, Esther, Paul, Peter, all had seasons of waiting and doing everyday tasks. God is present in these ordinary moments. He prepared them for years and decades, but they have had to leap. But they he prepared them before they had to leap. But we all know they were able to leap because they synchronized their thoughts and their desires with God's own thoughts and God's own desires. The Bible calls us to trust and believe that God will take care of our every step and detail in our lives. God doesn't want us to rely on him just for the sake of it but because he knows what's best for us and wants to refresh us and relieve us. When we understand the importance of faith, of everyday faith, we will be able to not only survive, but to grow and thrive. Scripture says, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to drink and enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? Did you know that our brains, our, our fear centers, are seven times faster at responding to negative things than to positive? And the more we practice those negative things, the faster we get at it. Anxiety builds and grows. Repeat those negative interactions in your own head. We relive them. We think about that uncomfortable moment or this uncomfortable moment. We grab onto this worry and work it from different angles. But what if we practiced the positive instead of the negative? Let's think of that last interaction we had as a missed opportunity and think of ways we can be positive next time practice those positives that we could do tomorrow, next week, whenever. Maybe that's just praying for others or choosing not to worry, but choosing not to worry by instead building new thoughts and we will grow that part of our brain and crowd out the negative. There are several scriptures imploring us to master our thoughts and turn towards God. That's what he means, don't let your thoughts run away. In scripture, Jesus says that the daily stress dominates our thoughts when we are unbelieving. And by unbelieving, I think it means we may be thinking those areas are too trivial to be important enough to bother God. But Jesus is saying to us that the source of our stress isn't the workload at work or the ongoing to-do list with home that is the issue. The source of my stress is our unbelief or our unwillingness to encourage a truly full-time relationship. And living that way may cause us to live in our own heads consumed by anxious thoughts, like how am, I, how am I ever going to get that done? Or I have too much on my plate to get to that. Or am I trying hard enough with dot, dot, dot. There are areas of our lives where we don't involve God or just carelessly not think he's applicable that it's insignificant to God. So we exclude him from those parts of our lives, and not on purpose. 
we have just given it no serious thought. But Jesus says we have to pray unceasing, unceasingly. Unceasingly, yeah. So back to basics. Are you about to pay bills? Pray first. Invite God into that stress. About to fold laundry? Work on a truck. Cook a meal? Plan for a week of meals? Weeding, mowing, plowing, cleaning, driving, clocking in at work, meeting with friends, planning a day with family, taking out the trash, all the mundane. That's where God meets us. That is where we learn the sound of his voice so that when we get to that precipice or are thrown into the lion's den, we already have God in our ear. We have practiced listening. You know, the Bible kind of listening. That means to hear and obey. We are cultivating a habit of prayer for those harder times. That's what builds our faith, brick by brick. All right, so what areas of your life have been dominating your thoughts recently? How can you bring God into those moments? Have you tried to bring God into those moments? There is a part of me that will always strive to be self-reliant. It's rather annoying. My pride wants to say, I did it on my own without any help. I've got this. This smaller detail in my life, the greater chance I will pick the self-reliant option. I don't need to bother anybody with these parts of my life. And as a result, I alienate God and other people from those areas of my life. We make the mistake of making the habit, making that the habit, just doing it ourselves and not the faith, not the communication. So for the last month, I haven't been able to do my self-reliant thing. Like the garbage is full and I'll just take it out. We all take turns, no one's waiting for anybody else. But it's hard to be like, okay, can someone else take out the trash? Because I really want to. <laughs> Or, um, I'm, I'm going to go fold laundry. Can someone bring me the laundry basket? Instead of just doing the things, it's this whole other step. And really, it's <sighs> exhausting. Do I even want to ask for help to do the thing? Or I just want to do the thing. But you have to pause and take a moment. And I've, had to, I've spent a month pausing and taking a moment. <sighs> I can't even push a grocery cart. <laughs> Okay, who wants to go grocery shopping with me? I can't push the grocery cart. I mean, sure, everyone helps unload when I get home, but the fact that I even have to ask for someone to push the cart, man. <laughs> so I've obviously made the mistake of leaning in to self-reliance and not communicating with God, not taking a moment, talking to God, including him in my day, communicating. So despite that pride, despite what pride may tell us, the scripture tells us another story, that God is interested, that he cares, that he desires to be involved with details in our lives. Have you ever been on a phone call, or better, a video call with a toddler? Even Remington, he's eight. <laughs> He runs around and he shows me everything and the phone's doing this and then he's talking and he's babbling and he's telling me about this game or this toy or showing me this or he's telling me about school and the phone's here and I'm looking at the ceiling and I can see part of the fan. <laughs> but I'm cooking dinner and he's talking and, and you got your video thing and it's not productive um, from point A to point B conversation. It's just keeping that relationship open. Again, for example, <clears throat> Remington's gone for two years at a time, but he still knows me as Aunt Kim because we have open communication and we talk. Not about anything important, literally nothing important. <laughs> I think I rode the dog on the phone last week. <laughs> but it's an open line of communication. He feels like he is connected and has that relationship with me. So can we not have an open line of communication with God? It doesn't have to be just the important moments. You know, when you call and you check in and, hey, this is what's going on. So-and-so started school. So-and-so is doing this class in college. So-and-so just had a baby. Check in on those moments for sure. But maybe 
try to have some some silly toddler moments with God where it's not important. You're just like, did you just see, I just tripped over that rug. Thanks for catching me. <laughs> Second Corinthians 10 tells us that spiritual weapons can overpower our human defenses, that self-reliance. These defenses come in the form of pride, self-reliance, intellectual arguments, emotional reasonings. We can have a lot of those as ladies. Ephesians 6 tells us that one of these many weapons that God provides for us is a shield of faith. Humans have the unique ability to imagine the worst possible outcome for any situation and often use too much energy to prepare for the worst. This is the way, this is the human way of fighting, but it leads us to exhaustion. It spends our mental and emotional energy on reacting to every situation that comes our way and trying to take control. Are you constantly on the defensive? This is because we don't prepare ourselves with our shield of faith. So all of those flaming arrows that you read about in that verse um, are hitting their mark. To have this shield of faith and follow God over our own thoughts and our own emotions, we need to decide to actively study and actively obey the scriptures. That's in Romans. Um, I, didn't add, keep, I didn't add the verse there. Romans 10, 17, if you want to look that up. And that means j not just simply reading or agreeing with the Bible, but finding and holding onto scriptures that help me focus on God and fight on the offensive rather than the defensive. We have to, be cl we have to clear out the cobwebs and dust off the kneeler and confess our, confess our shortcomings and leave that door open for that mundane part of our relationship. I, I worded it that way, leave that door open, because I saw, I saw a little video. Um, this lady, you just see a, um, a picture of a door, and this lady opens the door and um, goes like this. Hey, God, prayer request. Okay, thanks. And shuts the door, and, and he goes, wait. I, and the door's already shut. So let's just keep the door open, even if we're just popping in. If you keep the door open, he, you're still keeping, you're more likely to have that conversation. All right, so we did humble. We're still working on faith, on prayer. Number three, faith, prayer. Um, being in prayer with God opens the way for God to enter into our lives. And as we communicate, it opens ourselves to him, keeping the door open. Our faith and trust grows stronger. Philippians 4.19 says prayer helps us to align ourselves with God's will. One of many reasons to pray is to verbalize those thoughts and concerns and issues in our own head. Our, we, it organizes our needs and our desires, our thankfulness into solidified thoughts, not passing thoughts. They always say, Yes, you think those things, but really they're partial thoughts. But when you verbalize it, it means more. It, you, it takes you that extra step in your thought process. So praying to God about all these things, verbalizing these things, makes you more aware of them. You can think that God knows you are thankful, but do you know? Does your body know that you are thankful? Have you said it out loud? And has your body felt that? Or do you just, you're like, yeah, I'm thankful. No. What are you thankful for? Um, speak it. There's a song, Speak Life. Speak it. If you, it's a good one, too, if you want to look it up. If you haven't consciously expressed yourself, how can you work in concert with God to achieve anything? Do we just go through life and occasionally pick up church activities? Or do we live a life so centered in God's word that there's no difference from what you do at church to what you do at the grocery store, to working, to driving, or what you do at home? I got ready this morning and Logan says, that's what you're wearing to give the message? I'm like, yeah, I'm giving the message on everyday faith. This is me every day. In James 5, you read the prayer of faith. James 5.13, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them 
and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that they may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain in the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain. The earth produced crops. In this prayer, it's labeled the prayer of faith in the Bible. We are reminded that the earnest heart is felt most by God. He says continued prayer of a righteous man has tremendous power. That we should pray fervently, which means sincerely and focused, persistently and with conviction. This is where you get to be stiff-necked. Not to be stubborn without God, but to be stubborn in your need for him in your life. It also said the prayer should come from a righteous man, not a self-righteous man, but a righteous man, as in put on the breastplate of righteousness. This isn't something you earned. This is something that Jesus is providing so God will hear us. So we pray in the name of Jesus. He covers us when we are not worthy. So we gratefully take our robe of righteousness and claim Jesus. to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Something I learned studying this week is that the breastplate of righteousness is also called the breastplate of approval. Does God approve of what you are asking? Are you sincere, persistent, fervent? Jesus lived in a constant communication with God seeking time alone when he needed to more clearly hear his voice. But Jesus found purpose in everyday moments. I imagine the 30 years up until the moment he started his ministry were full of mundane moments. He was learning to listen and hear God in 30 years before he was able and willing to step out and start his ministry. He had to practice. These moments in the Bible are present to remind us that we too are called to live this way, living entwined in Christ and allowing his presence to infuse our everyday lives. Walking with Jesus means being present with him daily. This relationship shapes our identity and influences every aspect of our lives. This ongoing relationship is the essence of discipleship. Learning to live our lives as Jesus would if he were in our place. Jesus desires our lives to be fruitful, producing the fruit of the Spirit through his relationship with him, and fruitfulness comes not from striving on our own, but from constantly seeking Christ and allowing him to work through us. At this point, I'm to the end of that outline of that talk, so I'm going to repeat the things again. You need three basic things for faith. You need to have a willingness, you need to humble yourself, and you need to pray. And why pray? It's brought up so many times in the Bible. I am just going to read off a couple of prayer scriptures. Prayer helps us to align ourselves with God, God's will, Philippians 4.19. Praying to God helps us to grow closer to God, Psalms 145.18. Prayer shows you that your life is not about you, John 17.15. Prayer gives us strength and hope, Psalm 73.26. Praying gives us wisdom and guidance, James 1.5. Prayers will increase our faith, 1 Corinthians 2.5. Prayers bring peace and comfort. Philippians 4, 7. Joyfully seek God's forgiveness and resist temptation. Psalms 86, 5. Give thanks and praise. James 1, 17. And pray to experience God's miracles. 
I think this is one of the main reasons why it's uncomfortable for a lot of Christians to pray out loud in a group. It's so personal. And you're opening yourself up, your relationship with God to the scrutiny of other people. And it's not, it's not fun. If people will do it, we'll do it. We have faith, we'll step out, we'll take that leap to just pray out loud, but it's hard. But we'll practice and we'll get better. And we will try to listen and obey. There is a quick video that I wanted to include before I conclude. why we pray because like you pray for like safe traveling or you you pray for um, good grades or for health like God already knows if you're going to get into an accident or not you know and so it kind of like questions like if like you do have like free will basically like the other guy was saying Mm -hmm. but then again in the Bible like God was like I'm going to kill all these people but then Moses was like no I got this I'll handle this and then God like agreed so I mean it like contradicts it's like so does God like know Every, like, you know what I mean? Like, does God, like, know the plan, or does God, like, go with the flow with you, like, as you pray? Okay, and you ask a very hard question. Why pray? If God is all-knowing, why pray? All right. In our culture, too frequently, prayer is a way to hit the button to get the cosmic bellboy to fetch my bags. You know, I haven't studied for this test, Lord. I sure could use an A. So I'm praying to you for an A. And I sure would like a Mercedes in my driveway when I get home. Signed, clip. (laughs) All right. That's not real prayer. Prayer is not an attempt to get the goody-goodies. Prayer is an attempt to develop intimacy with God. See, according to Christ, the purpose of life is to know God, to love and worship God, and then to love and serve people. So the first purpose of prayer is to get to know God. And that's why when you read the Psalms, you'll notice what a struggle prayer is. Prayer is not, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Amen, good night. (laughs) It's not prayer, that's a magical formula, a ritual. Prayer is a real struggle, where I as a human being am struggling with God in prayer. That's the first point. Second point is, hopefully what I'm learning in prayer is to learn to align my will with God's will. That's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. That's good. I got a good buddy who ends all of his prayers with, not my will, but your will be done. Good. Very good. Thirdly, Does God use prayer to bring about his will? Absolutely yes. That's why James writes in James 5, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. In a way that I don't understand, God uses our prayers to bring about his will, to change events. He uses prayer. Does that mean that God depends upon our prayers? No. God doesn't depend upon our prayers. God does what God chooses to do. So, pray and learn to pray deeply right from your heart. Because prayer is you seeking to connect with the living God who loves you deeply. Watch out for people who say, if you pray this way, you get what you want. That's a lie. Prayer is not a technique to learn to get what I want. That ain't it. And you'll hear that often in the United States. Don't buy it. There's no magical way to pray so that your dying mother gets healed. There's no magical prayer to pray that you get a job. Okay? No. Prayer is, first of all, the human struggle to get to know God, to develop intimacy with God. Does God use our prayers? Yes, ma'am. Now, finally, 
What are the answers that God gives me to my prayers? First answer, no. No, Cliff. Often that is God's answer to my prayer. Second answer, slow. Slow down, Cliff. You're going too fast. It's going to take some time. Third answer, grow, Cliff. You got a lot of growing to do. Grow up. Fourth answer is, go, Cliff. You bet. You're right in line with my will. Go. So those four answers, I think, are options to all of us. No, slow, grow, and go. So that's how I work with the issue of prayer. And a call to action. Lisa Turncurst said, the reality is my prayers don't change God, but I am convinced prayer changes me. Praying boldly boosts, boots, boots me out of that stale place of religious habit into authentic connection with God himself. And Charles Spurgeon is quoted saying, true prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It is far deeper than that. It is a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. So our call to action is to reflect on our own lives and consider how we can invite Jesus into the ordinary and mundane moments. Recognize that every moment matters to God and he desires to walk with you daily, fruitfully, and joyfully. Embrace the sacredness of your everyday life and let Jesus transform it with his presence and love. In cookie cutter terms, let go and let God. Let's pray. May you find the beauty and significance in every moment of your life, knowing that because of Christ's sacrifice, we can have a personal relationship with the creator, that every moment matters to him, and I pray earnestly and sincerely that all here today meet God in many small moments in the days ahead. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.